Welcome to Light. This is chapter 27. And uh, make sure you have some notes, uh, note paper, and you can take notes for extra credit. Uh, just show them to me uh, before the quiz. The objectives are describe the dual nature of light, state what Albert Michelson's experiment value for the speed of light was, state the waves in the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, describe why certain materials are transparent to light, describe opaque materials, describe why shadows form, describe the evidence that suggests light waves are transverse, and describe 3D vision. Now there's a lot here that is unspoken. For instance, when you're looking at the Michelson's experiment, you also want to look at other experiments. You also want to look at just not just 3D vision. Uh, you also want to look at uh, polarization, describe the evidence that suggests light waves are transverse. So just because something's not mentioned specifically doesn't mean that you shouldn't look at it. Okay, light. The Doppler effect also occurs for light. Remember the Doppler effect with sound. When a light source approaches there is an increase in its measured frequency. When it recedes, there is a decrease in its frequency. So remember, when, when the object that's giving light, the source is moving towards us, you're going to squeeze the, you're going to squeeze the waves together so it'll be higher frequency. That'll be a blue shift. An increase in frequency is called a blue shift because the increase is towards the high frequency or blue and of the color spectrum. So remember those lines that were created uh, where they were the the rings were closer together that would be a blue shift and when they're farther apart it would be a red shift. The decrease a decrease in frequency is called a red shift referring to the low frequency or red end of the color spectrum. Distant galaxies for example show a red shift in the light they emit. A measurement of this shift enables astronomers to calculate their speeds of recession. In other words, how far they're, how fast they're going away from you. A rapidly spinning star shows a red shift on the side turning away from us and a blue shift on the side turning towards us. This enables a calculation of the star's spin rate. So there's a lot you can tell about a star just by measuring various things relative to the light that is emitted relative to the Doppler effect. The, <coughs> the radial Velocity method of exoplanet detection relies on the Doppler effect. When the starlight is shifted, is red shifted, it means the star is moving away from us. And when it is blue shifted, it means the star is moving towards us. This effect occurs because a planet doesn't orbit around a motionless star, but instead the planet and star orbit a common center of mass. You've heard lots of stories about these exoplanets that are being discovered. You can't actually see the exoplanet, uh, but you can see the stars and various aspects of the star's motion, which indicates that an exoplanet is present. Another, as, as depicted in this image, astronomers can detect an exoplanet thanks to the change in Doppler effect that the planet's gravitational pull exerts on its host star. Uh, those shifts are seen as red or blue color changes in the spectrum of light emitted by the star. Again, much of astronomy is an indirect science where we look at the effect, we look at, we look at variations in the light that stars are emitting and we can, we can tell whether or not there's a planet there uh, forcing the emission of certain light waves, etc. So astronomy is a very difficult science to, uh, to to talk about. Four European astronomers have taken advantage of the superb imaging quality of the ESO 3.5 meter new technology telescope NTT at La Salle at La Silla Observ Observatory to detect a galaxy at an extremely large distance. This galaxy is by far the most remote ever detected. In fact, it has taken its light about 90% of the age of the universe to reach us, and we now observe this early object as it appeared only 
one point one to two billion years after the universe was created in the big bang still the galaxy contains a considerable amount of elements that must have been produced in stars this proves that stars were formed in normal galaxies already before this very early epoch so always remember when you see the when you see the star when you see the light from all of these stars and galaxies you see the red shift and the blue shift stars going away for uh, galaxies going away from us galaxies going towards us uh, here's another example this is a perfect example of what i was talking about about a uh, the blue shift it's moving towards you the red shift it's moving away from you uh, in other words the source this can be this can be either sound or uh, light <coughs> fluorescence this is uh, uh, when you uh, fluorescence is going from ultraviolet to white light uh, that's a, a fluorescent bulb they're cooler cool bulbs relatively speaking these are the hot bulbs remember this light is 5% efficient effective as a light source and however 95% effective as a heat source this is just a little bit of a review based on stuff that we've done already but a trend, a fluorescence and incandescence is an important idea this is a very interesting uh, idea some ancient philosophers believe that light traveled from our eyes to objects we looked at rather than from the objects to our eyes well <clears throat> if that were true then then this giant picture of Mount Everest the would, would be emitting light and um, uh, our eyes our eyes would be would be shining the light on it it would be a, a massive amount of energy that you would need to use uh, uh, the first uh, demonstration that light traveled at a finite speed was supplied by the Danish astronomer Olas Romer about 1675 uh, light coming from Jupiter's moon Io that's the name of the planet uh, the name of the moon Io takes a longer time to reach Earth at position D than at position A the extra distance that light travels divided by the extra time it takes gives the speed of light so we're going to be looking at this particular example uh, how what what actually precipitated Aulaus Romer's understanding of the speed of light Romer made very careful measurements of the of the periods of the Jupiter's moons remember what a period is the innermost moon Io is visible through a small telescope and was measured to revolve around Jupiter in 42.5 hours Io disappears periodically into Jupiter's shadow so this period could be measured with great accuracy Romer was puzzled to find an irregularity in the measurements of Io's observed period again remember what a period is a period is the the amount of time it takes uh, for one cycle uh, he found that while Earth was moving around from Jupiter say from position B to C in the figure the measured periods of Io were all somewhat longer than average when Earth was moving towards Jupiter say from position E to F the measured periods were shorter than average Romer estimated that the cumulative discrepancy between positions A and D amounted to about 22 minutes uh, that is when Earth was at position D Io would pass in a Jupiter shadow 22 minutes late compared with observations at positions a <clears throat> now let me just remind you again what a period is uh, for instance one period at school is going to be 44 minutes so a period is the time for the event to happen that's period and the, the unit labels for period is always uh, seconds uh, in this case minutes I suppose all right uh, Christian Wiegand's correctly interpreted this discrepancy when Earth was farther away from Jupiter it was the light that was late not the moon Io passed in a Jupiter shadow at the predicted time but the light carrying the message did not reach Romer until it had traveled the extra distance across the diameter of the Earth's orbit there is some doubt as to whether Wiegand's knew the value of this distance in any event this distance is no is now known to be 300 million kilometers using the correct travel time of 
1,000 seconds for light to move across Earth's orbit makes the calculation of the speed of light quite simple, and it's all listed there for you. And the speed of light is 300 million meters per second, or 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Uh, this is the, the Michelson's experiment. Michelson used a mirror arrangement to observe the speed of light. A, light is reflected back to the eyepiece when the mirror is at rest. B and C, uh, reflected light fails to enter the eyepiece when the mirror spins. B, too slowly, or C, too fast. And D, when the mirror rotates at correct speeds, light reaches the eyepiece. Uh, the secret of understanding this particular little section on the Michelson experiment is to make sure that you understand very fully the, uh, the, uh, the drawing of Michelson and the spinning box. It's, uh, eight, it's uh, octagonal is eight sides. So make sure that you're really good at the figure before we continue. The most famous experiment measuring the speed of light was performed by the American physicist Albert Michelson in 1880. The figure shows how light from an intense source was directed by a lens to an octagonal mirror initially at rest. The mirror was adjusted so that a beam of light was reflected to a stationary mirror located on a mountain 35 kilometers away and then reflected back to the octagonal mirror and into the eye of an observer. Please, 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 you've, you've got to know this drawing. The drawing says it all. You will have no problem if you study the, the drawing. The distance the light had to travel to the distant mountain was known, so Michelson had to find only the time it took to make a round trip. When the mirror was spun, short bursts of light reached the mountain mirror and were reflected back to the spinning octagonal mirror. If the rotating mirror made exactly one-eighth rotation in the time the mirror made the trip to the distant mountain and back, the mirror was in position to reflect light to the observer. If the mirror was rotated too slowly or too quickly, it would not be in a position to reflect light. When the, when the light entered the eyepiece, Michelson knew that the time for the light to make the round trip and the time for the octagonal mirror to make one-eighth rotation was the same. He divided the 70-kilometer round trip distance by this time. Michelson Michelson's experimental value for the speed of light was 299,920 kilometers per second, which is usually rounded off to 300 kilometers per second. Michelson received the 1907 Nobel Prize in Physics for this experiment. He was the first American scientist to receive this prize. We now know that the speed of light in a vacuum is a universal constant or 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Light is so fast that a beam of light could travel around the, around the Earth and it would take 7.5 trips in one second. Unbelievable. Light entered the eyepiece when Michelson's octagonal mirror made exactly one-eighth of a rotation during the time light traveled to the distant mountain and back. Would light enter the eyepiece if the mirror turned one-quarter of rotation in this time or any multiple of, of, of uh, that yes light would re-enter light would enter the eyepiece whenever the octagonal mirror turned a multiple of one eighth rotation one quarter one half etc in the time the light made this round trip what is required is that any of the eight faces be in place when the reflected flash returns from the mountain Michelson did not spin the mirror fast enough however for these other possibilities to occur? The answer is yes, but he would have to spin it more quickly. This is one atomic uh, astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, light takes eight minutes to travel from the Sun to the Earth and four years to the next star, Alpha Centauri. The distance light travels in one year is called a light year. Now this next slide is pretty amazing 
uh, idea, and that is how far in kilometers would a beam of uninterrupted light travel in a year? The light, the speed of light is a constant, so <clears throat> its instantaneous speed and average speed are the same. From the equation for speed, V equals D over T, or in this case, C equals D over T, we can say that D equals CT, or 300,000 kilometers per second times one year, and you're going to convert you're going to convert one year into seconds, and the answer is going to be 9.5 times 10 to the 12th kilometers in one light year. So that's 9.5 trillion. 10 to the 10 to the 12th is trillion, uh, or tera, as opposed to a giga. Giga is 10 to the ninth. Uh, so that's uh, pretty far, actually. Uh, 100 years ago, in 1913, the young Danish researcher Niels Bohr sent a paper to the philosophical magazine in London that used quanta of packets of energy to solve a serious problem with theories about the atom. At the time, scientists thought the atom was like the solar system. Electrons orbit a nucleus of protons and neutrons. But anything that moves in a circle gradually slows, slowly radiates energy and so moves closer to the center of the orbit. Eventually, electrons would fall into the nucleus of the atom. Now remember, quanta are packets of energy, little uh, organized, predictable packets of energy that an atom will give up after it is excited. And this is what Niels Bohr. So he is sort of the father of, of quantum mechanics. Blatantly, they don't. Otherwise, everything in the universe would collapse and we wouldn't exist. Bohr proposed that electrons could only sit in discrete orbits or distances from the nucleus. And therefore, when electrons undergo transitions between orbits, they emit energy in discrete packets or quanta. They do not emit energy gradually. The electrons therefore stay put in their orbits and don't fall into the nucleus of the atom. Bohr was the first to show that packets of energy could successfully explain and predict the behavior of atoms, the stuff that makes up you and me. His results were only approximately correct, but a big improvement over previous theories. Now remember, that delta E, that energy, that quanta of energy, is actually electromagnetic radiation. That's what we're studying, light. It's electromagnetic radiation. Here are, here are three discrete orbits. Is a transition, and energy is given off as a photon. Here are the Lyman, Balmer, and Passion series from chemistry. And... The energy that it gives off, again, the quanta it gives off, or it gives off four separate quanta, uh, four batches of quanta, I should say, and that is red, green, blue, and violet. Here's another, uh, <clears throat> here's another computer-generated version of the same thing, and that is 410 nanometers to 656 nanometers. So the red would have the longer wavelength or the lower energy. A nanometer is a, is a billionth or 10 to the negative ninth. Here is hydrogen, helium, lithium, and oxygen. And uh, those are, again, uh, four separate, uh, four separate uh, elements. And then we have uh, radio waves, microwaves, infrared light, ultraviolet x-rays, and gamma rays. And they are uh, electromagnetic radiation. The visible light is a very small section of that. Uh, red is the longer wavelengths. Violet is the shorter wavelengths. Here's the definition of a wavelength, crest to crest. Or it could be trough to trough. Or it could be any complete cycle at any point on uh, the waves, any complete cycle. So... Uh, when you have uh, uh, light as wavelengths, just as sound 
wave can force a sound re uh, receiver into vibrations. A light wave can force charged particles in materials into vibration. Light passes through materials whose atoms absorb the energy and immediately re-emit it as light. Materials that transmit light are transparent. Glass and water are transparent. Visualize the electrons in an atom as connected by imaginary springs. When light hits the electrons, they vibrate. Materials that are springy or elastic respond more to vibrations at some frequencies than to others. Bells ring at a particular frequency. Tuning forks vibrate at a particular frequency. And so do the electrons in matter. The natural vibration frequency of an electron depend on how strongly it is attached to the nearby nucleus. Different materials have different electric spring strengths, which are unique depending upon the nuclear charge and the number of protons in the nucleus. The nucleus holds the electrons in orbit. Electrons in glass have a natural vibration frequency in the ultraviolet range. When ultraviolet light shines on glass, resonance occurs as the wave builds and maintains a large vibration between the electron and the atomic nucleus, just as a large vibration is built when pushing someone at the resonant frequency on a swing. Remember, these spring strengths are unique for individual substances, so that's pretty critical. The energy received by an atom can be either passed on to neighboring atoms by collisions or re-emitted as light. If ultraviolet light interacts with an atom that has the same natural frequency, the vibration amplitude of its electrons becomes unusually large. The atom typically holds on to this energy for about one million vibrations or 100 millionths of a second. During this time, the atom makes many collisions with other atoms and gives up its energy in the form of heat. That's why glass is not transparent to uh, ultraviolet. That Sunglass companies would love for you to believe that they do something special to the glass or the plastic, whereas most plastics and much glass is transparent, is, um, is not transparent to the ultraviolet radiation. The electrons of, of atoms in glass can be imagined to be bound to the atomic nucleus as if connected by springs. Uh, again, this gives them this idea of resonance, resonance. <clears throat> a light wave incident upon a pane of glass sets up vibrations of the atoms. Because of the time delay between absorptions and re-emissions, the average speed of light is actually less than C. <clears throat> the speed of light in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Light travels a bit less than C in the atmosphere, but its speed there is usually rounded off to C. In water, light travels 75% of its speed in the vacuum, or 0.75 C. In glass, light travels at about 0.67 C, depending on the type of glass. In a diamond, light travels at only 0.4 C, less than half of its speed in a vacuum. When light emerges from these materials into the air, it travels at its original speed, C. Notice how the light in is at the same angle as the light out. As the light enters a more dense material, it's refracted or bent towards the center, towards the normal. And then when it exits, it's refracted back to the original pathway, the original angle in which it entered. This is what you think the sky looks like. But the color of the sky is not actually from the blue family. Uh, and the reason it's not from the blue family is because it's from the violet family. But light does not contain, visible light does not contain very much violet. So our eyes never evolved to see violet well. So instead of violet, our eyes interpret the color of the sky as blue from the blue family but it's actually from the violet family. 
glass blocks both infrared and ultraviolet but is transparent to all the frequencies of visible light. Infrared waves, which have frequencies lower than visible light, vibrate not only the electrons, but also the entire structure of the glass. This vibration of the structure increases the internal energy of the glass and makes it warmer. Glass is transparent to visible light, but not to ultraviolet or infrared light. Sunglasses also would not be uh, would not be transparent to ultraviolet or infrared light as well. Those that absorb light without re-emission and thus allow no light through them are opaque. Wood, stone, and people are opaque. In opaque materials, any coordinated vibrations given by light to the atoms and molecules are turned into random kinetic energy, that is, into internal energy. So the opaque object will absorb some of the material, but it is, uh, it's not going to be transparent to it because of the nature of opaque. So you can have heat added. Some of the energy can be turned into heat. Uh, when light travels from a more dense to a less dense medium, the light bends away from the normal, the center line. If it's going from low density into high density, such as air into glass, it would be, or water, it would be bent towards uh, the normal, towards the center line. Uh, very important uh, when we study uh, reflection, reflection and refraction. Here I have a variety of things happening. I have light. Uh, passing through, uh, it's more dense, so it's going to be bent towards the normal and then away at the original orientation. I have light ref uh, reflected, uh, the blue is reflected, and those terms you need to be very, very familiar with. Blue is reflected, so the object looks blue. Red and green are absorbed, thereby rendering the object warmer due to an increase in internal energy. I want to bring you back just for a second, and you've got to know what transmitted light, uh, uh, absorbed light, reflected light, uh, opaque, translucent. You need to know what all those terms mean. Here's a perfect example of light going from high density into low density, uh, where the light is... Uh, is bent away from the normal because it's going into low density material and then uh, when it leaves it's bent to the same orientation so when it hits the eye it's uh, it's back to the original uh, orientation in which it entered the material here it's going from uh, low density material into high density material again the light enters it's bent towards the normal and then when it goes back into air, it is refracted away from the normal so that the, the light in air before it entered and the light in air when it exited is at the same angle, is at the same orientation uh, when it hits the eye. Why is glass transparent to visible light but opaque to ultraviolet and infrared? Very, 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 very important, important question. The natural frequency of vibration for electrons in glass matches the frequency of ultraviolet light. So resonance in the glass occurs when ultraviolet waves shine on it. These energetic vibrations of electrons generate heat instead of wave re-emission. So the glass is opaque to ultraviolet. In the range of visible light, the forced vibrations of electrons in the glass are more subtle and re-emission of light rather than the generation of heat occurs. So the glass is transparent. Lower frequency infrared causes entire atomic structures, not just electrons, to resonate. So heat is generated and the glass is opaque 
to infrared. A heater at the tip of this submerged J tube produces convection currents in the water. They are revealed by shadows cast by light that is deflected differently by the water of the different temperatures, different temperature water, different density. Remember, the density of material will bend light differently. Uh, it, more dense will bend it towards the, towards the normal, etc. Here's an example of fast light coming into a piece of glass and bending towards the normal, and then upon leaving it bends away from the normal, creating this, um, this kind of uh, this refraction of light. Here I have an umbra. The shadow, the sharpness of a shadow depends on the distance between the object and the wall. An object held close to a wall casts a sharp shadow. That sharp shadow is called an umbra. Here I have the formation of a penumbra. As the object is moved farther away, penumbras are formed and cut down on the umbra. The penumbra is kind of a, a little bit of a twilight, twilight shadow around the original dark umbra. And you know the word umbra, believe it or not. You just don't realize you know the word umbra. When it is very far away, all the penumbras mix together into a big blur. Now, why are lunar eclipses more commonly seen than solar eclipses? I want you to review the concept of an eclipse. There are usually two of each every year. However, the shadow of the moon on the Earth is very small compared with the shadow of the Earth on the moon. Only a relatively few people are in the shadow of the moon, solar eclipse. While everybody who views the nighttime sky can see the shadow of the Earth on the moon or a lunar eclipse. A solar eclipse, again, this is a picture of a solar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth, the shadow of the moon is on the Earth. Uh, now, we know the word umbra because um, anybody who, most women know the word umbre, umbre, uh, sombra in Spanish, uh, umbre in French, umbrare in Italian, uh, general English definitions, penumbra is twilight, umbra is shadow. If you go to a bullfight, the the cheapest seats are sol, or the sun seats. Uh, the most expensive seats are the sombra, and the intermediate seats, the middle median cost seats, are the sol y sombra, uh, sun and shadow. So shadow is really what uh, om, ombre, when you look at that woman, the ombre style of hair coloring. This is a picture of an eclipse, two eclipses. An eclipse of the sun occurs when the moon's shadow falls on the earth. You can see that's very small, uh, that shadow of the moon. That's why not a lot of people see it. An eclipse of the moon occurs when the earth's shadow falls on the moon. That's a much larger shadow, and more people can see it in answer to that particular question. The next thing we're going to look at is, is why, what proof that, earth is, that light is waves. Non-polarized light vibrates in all directions, 360 degrees. Horizontal and vertical components at an angle, all kinds of 365 degrees. Uh, and then when you put them through a slit, where only the vertical component passes through, that's, that's polarized, the polarizer. Uh, and the second one, those are polar, that's polarizing. That's how you polarize light. It's light in one dimension. If I take two polarized lenses and I put them perpendicular to one another, uh, no light, vertical component, does not pass through the second polarizer. So uh, it's one way to, to understand that light uh, is, uh, has a duality function, and not only a photon, but of also waves. This is a, a fence depiction of wave motion 
transmitted. Uh, the waves can go through the upright slits, but then when I turn one of them around, it doesn't go through. It doesn't go through. The wave motion is blocked when I have, uh, when I turn the two polarizing, the two fences uh, 90 degrees perpendicular to each other. The, the polarized light doesn't go through the second polarizer. Here, light is transmitted uh, when the axes of the polarizing filters are aligned. So they're both vertical. Okay, they're both vertical. Now, if you will go into a store and you want to see if two two pairs of sunglasses are uh, are polarized, then you would turn them 90 degrees to each other. So if, if she takes that 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 filter and turns it 90 degrees, light can't go through it. It's blocked. So if you take two sunglasses and you put them 90 degrees to each other and they don't block out the sun, then one of the pairs, if not both of the pairs, are not polarized at all. And you're wasting your money. Here's an interesting thing where I take two, two, two um, polarizing slides. I put them 90 degrees orientation from each other. And then I um, slip one in that's 45 degrees. I can now see. I can see through it, which is a little weird. And I'll show I'll show you in class how that works with resolution of vectors. I'll show you how that works. Here I have uh, three polarized glasses. Uh, the driving glasses it's polarized vertically. Uh, those are the good polarized rays. The horizontally polarized rays are glare. And 3D polarized lenses are one is vertical and the other one is horizontal now if I if I'm looking at uh, polarized light uh, from a projector there you can see how the lenses are 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 polarized and then you would wear the polarized glasses and, and that will give you the 3d image now Following are three, four optical illusions. I want you to look at the optical illusions and think to yourself, for instance, are these two lines parallel or are they, or are they uh, the lines bent? It might be easier to see in your textbook. I'm not quite sure this is a good example of that. But if you kind of look at the center of the drawing, you can see. Anyway, the next one, uh, if you put a pencil in between, the, like right along the seam where the two halves meet, you want to cover that boundary between them with a pencil and see if uh, both rectangles are equally bright. So look at that one. I think I'm giving these each like 30 or 45 seconds. Two left. There's another one with a hat. Is the hat taller than the brim is wide? You want to take, maybe take a rule or something while you're viewing this and see if you can determine whether or not that's true. This is right out of your textbook, by the way. This is only four of them. I think there are several others, but <clears throat> you can look them up on on the internet for more of them. Are the tiles really crooked? We know that they're in uh, zigzag patterns, but are the tiles themselves crooked? Okay, again, take some notes, extra credit to be turned in with your for your quiz make sure you look at the dates of your quiz it's going to come up very soon have a great day and goodbye